I remember my friend, Lazzi, was on the roof. He was fixing igniters to some Molotov cocktails he was making out of bottles. He was all fingers and thumbs. He said... Come on, Eddie! Don't you hear it? And then, yes, I heard from the distance the roar of the engine. It was a tank. A Russian tank approaching down the narrow street below us. We fumbled with the matches. We were so excited. Now! And I remember how both bottles hit the tank together and flashed into flame. And I remember the turret lid flip up. And I remember the Russian tank crew scrambling out of the burning wreckage. October 1956, Hungary. In the streets of the capital Budapest, the Hungarian people take up arms to fight the forces of Soviet communism under which they'd lived for 11 years. Brother and sister Edda and Judith Pfeiffer escaped Hungary soon after the failure of the rebellion. Reconstructed here using actors, their account of Hungary's struggle comes from Edda's book, written in London one year later. It's the story not just of the uprising, but of the lives of young Hungarians living as children under communist rule, oppressed by the East, abandoned by the West, the real victims of the Cold War. I remember, right from the start, how the Russians called themselves our liberators. I was only a boy, eight years old. Judith was a little older. The Russians were pushing the Nazis back. This was 1944. But we knew from the start they'd be no better than the Nazis. They looted us. They raped Hungarian women. Hungarian girls. The first words of Russian any of us learnt was give and then watch. Give, watch. You saw them with watches all the way up their arms. Trophies. But then, almost straight away, the lies began. How we should be grateful for Stalin who'd saved us. Stalin who loved us. Just as in Czechoslovakia, Poland and most of Eastern Europe, the years 1945 to 1949 brought gradual, then total, Soviet control in Hungary. In 1945, the communists had polled just one-sixth of the vote, but they undermined the other parties, cut out their rivals. By 1949, Matthias Rakoshi ruled a communist one-party state. Rakoshi was Hungarian, but he spent the war in Moscow. He was a hardline Stalinist determined to run Hungary on Soviet lines. Our father was a music teacher. At school, the first thing they said was, we must register your parents by class. They said, worker, peasant, or intellectual. And later I said to father, they say you're an intellectual, which made him smile. But then we learned intellectuals were class enemies. This was not good. Hungary had always been a farming nation with plenty of food from the countryside. Under the communists, livestock and crops were shipped to the USSR. There were food shortages. Meanwhile, Rakashi introduced five-year plans for industry along the Stalinist model, with impossible production targets that merely encouraged shoddy work and fake statistics. Edda and Judith's mother was forced to work in a factory. She fell sick under the strain of delivering the punishing quarters. (laughs) 
Little opposition to Rakashi can be seen in archive films. The propaganda showed public displays of wild support. Edda joined the pioneers, the communist youth movement. Activities in and out of school glorified the communist ideal, a wave of indoctrination drowning out all opposition. In any case, behind the system was force and fear. A network of informers were paid to denounce their neighbors to the Arvel, Rakashi's security police. I remember, this must have been 51, 52, a month or two when all Budapest was in fear. The Arvo were making arrests, taking people to prison camps, no reason. We kept a suitcase packed in case they came for us. Every sound at night you thought it was them. I remember one night I woke up. I asked, what is it? She said, they're in the building. They're coming up the stairs. Shh. Is it us? Is it us they want? Get dressed, Daddy. No. Wait. It's not this floor. Oh, God. Judith was standing by the window, looking down. There were trucks with canvas sides. Men with machine guns, pushing people on. A man pulled up. Get there! Get back from the window! I was so frightened. This, then, was the reality for so many in Eastern Europe under Stalinist control. But then, in 1953, Joseph Stalin died. It was an extraordinary moment. The tears were not reserved for die-hard communists. Stalin's influence was so great, it was said that even in the prison camps, people wept. But almost at once, in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe alike, it was as if a shadow had lifted. Later, people called it the Thor. The first we knew was when we stopped singing the Soviet national anthem at school. And then Uncle Belush came home. He'd been five years in the camps. We didn't even recognize him. And then, for a while, they replaced Rakushi. Moscow thought he was too hard lying. And then, in 56, these amazing rumors spread that in Russia, Khrushchev had spoken out against Stalin, had condemned Stalin's memory. To us, this seemed extraordinary. Nikita Khrushchev had become General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 1955. A typical Soviet communist, son of a coal miner from the Ukraine. He'd been a devoted Stalinist throughout the 30s and 40s. But in February 56, in his so-called secret speech to the 20th Party Congress, he destroyed the cult of Stalin forever. He spoke with regret of the purges, of the terror. Prisons were opened. For some, it seemed to suggest a further relaxation of Soviet control was on the way. From Eastern Europe, Poland especially, came news of popular success against the Soviets. The Kremlin had climbed down and agreed that the national hero Gomulka should return to power. An enormous crowd heard him declare that the days of red domination were over. For many in Hungary, hearing the news, the future seemed full of questions. So, Eddie, 
What will you do now, eh? Just sit on your backside like you always do? It was such a strange feeling. All my childhood I'd been locked into this communist world. All of us. We all felt so trapped. The party stifling us. Our education, the jobs we might do. My father never understood. He thought we had accepted the regime. It was not true. But what could we do? We had no alternative if we didn't want to starve. But in October 1956, it was as if all of us, all at once, simply decided not to take it anymore. The uprising began with a peaceful demonstration, a crowd gathering on October 23rd in the Parliament Square. Edda was there. Some poems were read. The police ordered them to disperse. The crowd refused. And then they moved en masse to the great bronze statue of Stalin, symbol of the old regime. By the time I got there, they already had ropes around his neck. They were rocking it backwards and forwards, and it crashed onto its face. And the metal workers broke it into pieces with their blowtorches. And everyone was dancing on the pieces as if the bronze was flesh. And by this time, you could hear some shooting. And the next thing I remember, there was this woman shouting. There was a big crowd. I pushed my way through, and it was Judith hair all over her face, and she was raging and shaking her fists. And do you remember what you were shouting? Now or never. Just now or never. And just then, an ambulance tried to get past. But it was obvious the ambulance drivers were from the Arvo. They had the wrong clothes on. So we stopped them. And inside the ambulance, we found ammunition. And so we were armed. Across Hungary, the uprising spread fast. A general strike of workers, armed by sympathetic troops of the Hungarian army, led to the joyful destruction of the symbols of their oppression. There seemed at first little opposition to the uprising. The communist leadership was caught off guard. A march on the headquarters of the Hungarian state radio prompted some AVO resistance. Shots were fired, but it only served to inflame the rebellion further. By day two, when Soviet troops arrived to prop up the Hungarian Communist Party, the freedom fighters were already well organized. They drew the tanks into narrow alleys, dropped Molotov cocktails into their petrol tanks, Within five days, the freedom fighters controlled the streets. Men, women, children, brought up in communism, now the victors against two Soviet divisions. For the AVO, justice was swift and unforgiving. Hatred against them further inflamed by the horrors found when the rebels stormed their headquarters. Foul-smelling prison cells, torture chambers. A week into the uprising, Edda found himself in a room in the Communist Party headquarters. In it were the complete records of the party. Eleven years of communist control open to view. Eddie? Look at this. What is it? Everything. Everything we've suffered all our lives. Look. It was sickening. Lists of men and women spied on. Denunciations. Reports even on members of the party. They were spying on themselves. We had this nightmare vision 
of what the archives would look like if the whole world fell under communist domination. The miles of filing cabinets needed to contain all that hate. Meanwhile, outside, the cameras captured extraordinary scenes. People reading uncensored pamphlets for the first time. The newspapers describing the changes sweeping across the country. Imre Naj, a socialist elbowed aside in the Rakashi years, had been recalled to power. He ordered the removal of the Soviet occupying forces. People watched as Soviet diplomats packed their bags. There was talk of free elections even of Hungary's withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact, the alliance of Eastern European nations under Soviet control. Budapest was alive with a new sense of freedom. But the question hung in the air. Could it last? Would the promise of Khrushchev's thaw be delivered? Would Hungary be allowed to keep its newfound freedom? A clue came with a document Edda found amongst the Communist Party files. Look at this. After Khrushchev's secret speech, a list of people to keep an eye on. Bait. I don't understand. The secret speech was just bait. Bad mouth Stalin. See who agrees, arrest them. Don't believe it. Look at it. What does this mean for us, Eddie? If the thaw was just a lie, where does that leave us? All of a sudden, we remembered something that we'd seen the day before, which then had made no sense. We'd been on a food run into the countryside. On our return, just outside Budapest, we had to slow down the truck to pass these Soviet troops, armoured cars, tanks, just sitting there alongside the road, the soldiers standing, smoking, smiling at us. Not the troops we'd fought in Budapest. Not the troops that had withdrawn. But fresh troops from further east, you could tell from their faces. And we wondered, what were they doing there? And no explanation seemed either convincing or particularly comforting. Now it all made horrible sense. Why would the Soviets just let Hungary walk away? It's not in their nature. They're going to crush us, aren't they? Get these papers into boxes, the ones that matter. We'll get them home, all right? I think we should get home. On November the 4th, 1956, just as they'd feared, Khrushchev ordered the troops outside Budapest back into the capital to crush the Hungarian uprising. For Khrushchev, Imre Naj's call to leave the Warsaw Pact was the final straw. Because though Khrushchev did reject the myth of Stalin, he'd only done so to build up another myth of Lenin, of the party, of communism itself. He wasn't going to let Hungary undermine the United Soviet front. It was hopeless. The Soviet army struck with such sudden and overwhelming force there was no chance to resist. For five days we were holed up in our room, only leaving to find food information on the streets wherever they found resistance the tanks opened fire till whole buildings collapsed like sand castles what is it it's not my blood i didn't know him he was under a tank we have to get rid of the grenades we have to burn the papers they're rounding people up anyone with leaflets ammunition anything they're shooting out of hand have to leave. How's father? He wants to rush out into the street shouting, Down with communism! Don't you, father? Shh! 
This is Hungary calling. The last remaining station. For to the United Nations. We are requesting you to send us immediate aid for the sake of God and freedom and of Hungary. On the radio, we heard the last calls to the West for help. And I think we knew no help would come. But they start a war that could destroy the whole world just for the sake of Hungary. It was said we needed either military intervention or a miracle from heaven. If the angel Gabriel came down with a flaming sword, that would be military intervention. If the United Nations arrived with tanks, that would be the miracle from heaven. You heard of brave little strikes. The workers in the factories keeping the revolt alive. But one by one, the strikes were broken. Until all that was left of our resistance were a few knots of desperate people huddled in doorways singing the national anthem. Edda left Judith to burn the papers they'd discovered. He knew the communist militia would come to arrest him, as they came for many too prominent in the uprising. Emre Naj was seized and eventually shot. Thousands more were rounded up and sent to labor camps. Edda and later Judith and their parents were amongst the 200,000 Hungarians that escaped to the west, crossing the border into Austria. And so, for us, it's all over. Yet in a way, it's only the beginning. Communist regimes are a kind of constant civil war between the rulers and the people. Millions of young people living in the gigantic prisons their own countries have become know that this is the bitter truth. In one of the cells behind the Iron Curtain, the prisoners broke the lock in the autumn of 56. The jailer arrived in time to shut the door. But I like to hope no locksmith can make the lock quite so safe again. First, 1960, 1,300 miles into Soviet airspace, an American U-2 spy plane was flying at 65,000 feet, out of range, in theory, from Soviet missiles. But then, at 8.23 a.m. Moscow time, the pilot, Gary Powers, felt the dull thump of a missile exploding nearby. I felt the aircraft jerk forwards. I saw a tremendous flash like the cockpit in the sky, and I thought, oh boy, I've had it now. For the Soviets, this proof that America had invaded their airspace was a major propaganda triumph. Khrushchev told the world, we've got the pilot. But it was America, not just powers, they put in the dock. The incident brought into focus the real nature of the Cold War. Not a war fought on the battlefield, but a war of espionage, a war of propaganda, 
a war of arms race bluff and counter bluff. Gary Powers spent three years in a Soviet jail, 